Hey guys, it's MJ, the Student Actuary, and what I want to do in this video is talk about something called an infinite reserve. So it's a new idea. Um, essentially, it is a combination of actuarial science um, with regards to like reserve management. It it takes up a lot of stuff from blockchain, Bitcoin, smart cash, masternodes, those things, and as well as a little bit of economics with regards to uh, monetary supply um, and this thing known as quantitative easing. So these are the three ideas or topics that I've used to create an infinite reserve. But I think before we, we go into it and we see why it's so wonderful, Let's just take a step back for those of us who you know, might be saying, "Why? what are reserves in the first place? Okay, now reserves are critical for insurance. Insurance works as, you know, hi, I can be this guy over here. Um, I have this farm with a whole bunch of crops. And I go to an insurance company and I say, I'm going to pay you a premium every month. And this could be, say, $10.00. And if anything happens to my farm, if it gets burnt down, gets attacked by wasps or whatever it is, um, the company is going to pay me $1,000 as a benefit. So we've got the premium that the farmer pays to the company, to the insurer, and the insurer is going to pay 1000 back to the farmer um, in order to make their benefit. Now, how this relationship works is that this isn't the only farm. You know, there are... There are lots of farms, lots of farms They can be in this area, there can be a whole bunch of farms in this area, a lot of farms over here. Um, you kind of get the idea. Each with their own uh, farmer doing his little farming thing. And each one of these farmers are going to be paying, if they're insured with the insurance company, they're going to be paying a premium. And they will only get the benefit if something happens to their farm. Now, because they're only getting 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, in this case, it's, you know, their total premiums are only $60. Um, and we know that a farm could get infected, it could spread and hit you know, multiple farms in the region. These claims can exceed uh, the premium. So, in other words, let's write it rather, stick to the jargon we're using, benefits can exceed premiums. Um, in bad years, in bad years for the insurance company. So in order to, to handle these situations, what the insurance company does is they will set up something known as a reserve. And to build up a reserve, you have the, the wealthy investors. They are going to you know, maybe say, okay, cool, here is one million US dollars to set up the reserve. Then each part of the premium, so you see how we saw these premiums of being, how much was our premiums? $10. Of that premium $10, a portion of that also goes into the reserve. So the premium becomes a little bit more expensive in order to just create a bit of a buffer for the reserve. Now what happens if total uh, claims or total benefits paid uh, are greater than premiums plus reserves, then what we say is a the insurance company has failed and that ruin has occurred. We don't want ruin to occur because what ruin means, not only does it wipe out your insurance company but um, and wipe out your investors, but it also wipes out the poor farmers because they don't actually have the money needed to replant their crops and, and to get their show back on the road. So if your reserves die, the insurance company dies. So reserves are very, very important. And because of this, because of reserves are so very, very important, there is a lot of regulation, which I don't like. I just, I just don't like, I, I understand we need regulation in the market, but, but at the moment, everything is just over overly regulated and it just takes away a lot of the fun in doing business 
So regulations will say you need to have you know enough capital at any amount of time, and, and actuaries actually spend a lot of time. It's actually because of regulation that actuaries have jobs, uh, because there's so much models and stress testing and scenario analysis, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done to keep the insurer happy, uh, the regulator happy that the reserves are enough. So I was thinking, I was thinking, seeing that. We're not a big fan of regulation. Seeing that regulation is all about reserves, and it's because of reserves that we need massive investors, we need, or we're at this risk of probability, and it makes our premiums a little bit higher. Is there not a way to get rid of the need for reserves altogether? And I think there is. Well, I'm hoping so. I'm actually making this video so that you, if this is a bad idea, you guys let me know in the comment section below. You, you just be like, MJ, this is bad. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. You've, you've completely been blindsided by this. But I'm going to show you how we can take a reserve, that whole mechanism of a reserve, and make it infinite. Okay. And that means step two of the, the things that we need to look at and that is blockchain and hopefully you guys have been following my channel for a while now so that you are comfortable with how blockchain works bitcoin ethereum all those lovely things but essentially blockchain it is a chain of blocks it's exactly what its name says not a lot of imagination in that name um, but essentially you have these blocks with their transactions uh, they chain together with some crypto um, you know, just to make it all, all nice and secure. But what happens is uh, there are these things known as block rewards, and block rewards are used to inject coins into the system. And what they do is they use it to reward the miners. And miners are the guys who have got their computers that are actually building the blockchain, uh, doing the hash functions, uh, making sure that the whole network is secure. But how blockchain works is that these coins are injected into the system. And one thing I've always had an issue with is this word called mining. Because mining, you know, I'm, I'm from South Africa, mining is a very big part of our economy. So most of the children here have a little idea of what mining is. And mining, for those of you who don't know, is going to you know, a bunch of rocks, uh, smashing them up and extracting the ore, um, extracting the, the metal that already is inside the rock. With blockchain, that's, that's not the case. There wasn't like, oh, these coins were like embedded in the, in the computer programs and we're now extracting those coins. That, that's a bad, bad metaphor. What's, what's happening when these coins are being injected into the system, they are being created. Okay? They, they're being minted. Um, yes, they are being minted according to a strict formula. There is this algorithm that's in place and, and it's incredibly difficult to alter it. Um, you'd need to do some sort of hard fork, but I'm going way off topic. But the idea is that these coins are created. They are minted. They are, and, and they're coming out of thin air. Um, according to what the algorithm says, they're not being mined or discovered or unlocked or anything like that. And that's an important concept to bear in mind when I bring in my idea. Because I'm now thinking, instead of releasing coins into my, my system by rewarding the miners, we can have that. We can have like a little bit of a block reward to incentivize people to maintain the integrity of the chain. But what we can also do is we can also put in at the Genesis block um, or into a smart contract or into the, the, the crypto code, um, a bunch of other rules, a bunch of other rules for coins to be created into the ecosystem. And this is where, this part of it is, is fine. I know some people will be a little bit upset with the, the philosophy of this because it does seem a bit weird. But, and that's why we are going to talk about quantitative easing and monetary supply at the end. That's more to just justify why, why we can get away with doing this. But essentially, the idea would be that we, let's say we have our blockchain up and running, um, and we have this guy comes with his farm, and he wants insurance. What he will do is he will pay a premium okay, 
to create something known as a smart contract. Um, please read up more about that if you don't know what it is. Um, he will pay a smart contract and he'll pay $10 in my crypto coin. Let's call them crop coin. So C with a little line through it. That looks horrible. Let me write it again. Okay, so he pays 10 crop coin into the smart contract. Think of these coins as being destroyed. Okay? Because there's no insurance company here. It's, it's decentralized. There isn't a, a central authority. Um, all these ICOs where oh, you pay coins and the coins, you know, percent of the coins go to the centralized fund. I'm like, well, you're not, you're not decentralized. Um, although, in all, all honesty, we're going to see there is a little bit of centralization in this, but, you know, we can forgive that. Uh, but we'll talk about it when we get there. We've got the farmer. He pays his premium to the smart contract and these coins are destroyed. Any smart contract can be, you know, how long he wants the contract to be, um, the, the location of his farm, uh, the size of the farm, the type of crops, um, and the, the current, because what we will do is we'll link it to, to the, the USD or whatever stable currency, because um, that's one of the big, big things that people don't like about crypto is that the price is variable. I'll show you how the infinite reserve can handle that. So that, that's no longer a problem. Uh, but essentially, you come into the smart contract, you input all your details, and it's going to tell you, okay, the premium you need to pay based on the current USD price, the length, uh, the length of the contract, one year, one month, whatever, the location, the size, the crops, all those other risk factors, it's 10, 10 crop coins. Then what happens, okay? And this is why it kind of has to be done with crops, and this is where the little bit of the centralization comes. There's going to be a satellite in the sky. Now, I'm not making this up. This isn't like, oh, Michael's going into sci-fi Star Wars, okay? There actually is this technology. It was part of the inspiration of this idea. What the satellite does is it will check out the spectrum, okay? The spectrum of the crops, now, what do I mean by the spectrum of the crops? Well, think about it. You can use this in, in like, let's say you, you, you check out a leaf, okay? Uh, yay, look at this cool little leaf. If it's green, you know it's healthy. If it's brown, you know that it doesn't have a long way to go. Now, what a satellite can do is not only just look at the visible spectrum of light, you know, from green to brown, but it can also start looking into the infrared. Um, you know, these are, are wavelengths that are beyond our visible spectrum. And what it can start doing, it can not just say if the, the leaf is green or brown, it can also say whether um, it's brown because it's got a lack of water, a lack of care, a lack of nitrogen, um, or if it's being attacked by a pesticide, or if it was a fire, or whatever, whatever, whatever. So much so that when it comes to our smart contract, we can actually include, well, what, what risk events do you want to insure for? Do you want to insure for yellow wasp? Do you want to insure for uh, lack of water? Um, and what this can do, because let's say you insure crop failure against black wasps, but then you just decide you're not going to pay for the water to irrigate your farm. And the farm dies and you say, oh, look, the black wasps might have eaten, eaten everything and that's why everything's dead. The satellite in the sky is going to be like, no, your crop failed because you failed to irrigate it. And there isn't a drought in your area, so it's due to your negligence that your crop failed and we're not going to cover it. But the satellites can also have the power to say, oh, look, the crops are dying because, because of the black wasp, which is written in the, the contract, and therefore what we're going to do is we're going to send information to the smart contract and give it the authority to send out the benefit. Okay, and this is where this is where a lot of things happen. So, so listen carefully. So the satellite is a little bit centralized. We could have multiple satellites, and they all need to have some sort of consensus. You can do that, um, but that does increase the cost. But I, the idea is that you have the satellite in the sky that sees when the crops are failing, and then automatically makes that payout. So 
I'm a farmer. I don't have time to go into the city um, to contact the insurance company, wait for them to send their person to validate the claim, do an entire inspection, you know, have the investigation. Oh, was this fraud? Was this fraud? And you know, drag their their feet in the ground. No, what's happening to this? What's happening right here is as soon as my crops fail, or even these things might pick it up just before, send the payment, and I've got the money, and I can take. Uh, measures to either prevent it or start regrowing or doing whatever farmers do. Now, this is where the cool part comes in. We have the smart contract, we have this farmer, we have the satellite. Okay, farmer sends in the premium. If the satellite gives the go ahead by looking at the farmer, it pay smart contract pays out this benefit. But this benefit, the coins, the coins that it creates, okay, to make this benefit, never existed before. Which means no matter how large the claim is, if the claim is, so if, if I've got a premium and it's for 1 million, or I've got a premium and it's for 10 trillion, okay, okay theoretically, I don't think anybody's got a farm with 10 trillion dollars. But anyway, just, just for, for illustrative purposes, if I send up my farm, and I've got 10 trillion, then ta-da, the smart contract can create the coins according, this is, will be one of the rules part of our blockchain, is that the smart contract has the authority to create coins and pay the farmer when the, the premium happens. Now, I know, I know a lot of you are uncomfortable with the idea of just creating coins out of thin air, you know, don't coins have to be mined, you know, all this computer power needs to be, you know, put into the system in order to get the coins. Like I said, I don't like the mining analogy, I know mining is a cool word, it sounds cool, oh look at me, I'm mining, you know, one of the seven dwarfs, ooh, going to get, extract some gold, bitcoins, digital gold, it, it does, it's a nice metaphor. But in fact, the coins are being created, they're being minted. And they're just being minted in quite a block uh, reward way, what we're doing is we're essentially creating the coins as it goes. Now the best part, well this is where it could get even better, is imagine if when they, a premium is paid and a co this contract is set up, the smart contract also can pay the satellite owners in the coin. So the satellite owners get the coin, okay, from the, uh, so the premium can be, let's say it's 10 bucks, the satellite company could get paid a hundred, depending on what the cost is. And this is the cool thing: is that your expenses can exceed your premium, which you've never been able to do before in insurance. Um, you pay the satellite, and then what is lovely is that the premium actually can be quite. It can be significantly low. It can be five because you don't have to worry about expenses, profit loading, um, and reserve management. And the benefit can be the actual benefit. And like we were talking about the current USSD, let's say you pay uh, for your farm and this coin crashes just because, you know, cryptocurrencies crash and um, the, the value of this coin goes from being, you know, $1 equals one crop coin to now $1 equals um, 100 crop coin. You know, you're like, wow, this coin's absolutely plummeted. The smart contract, before it releases the benefit, it checks the price of the USSD. So if you were supposed to get, say, uh, $100 for your claim, which was 100 crop coin, and it sees that this difference in price fluctuation has occurred, before it makes that benefit, it will adjust it so that your $100 is equal to 10,000 crop coins. And so that the farmer is getting paid out in USD. And I know some crypto enthusiasts will probably want to kill me for, you know, pegging it to, um, to a fiat currency. It's not part of the whole philosophy. But it's something we just need to do in the interim before crypto completely takes over the world. Maybe in the future we could link it to Bitcoin. Um, but for now, what, what can happen is your infinite reserve, where the smart cash is... You know, getting the money from, it has the ability to uh, price in, or not price in, it's, it's able to, to make up that difference because it's pulling from an infinite reserve because coins are being created when benefits are, are paid. Okay, now you might be saying, 
wow, who on earth is going to want to have the crop coin? I mean, this coin sounds like it's going to get inflated to death. You know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin has a limited supply and Bitcoin is, that's why it's got deflation happening. Um, I always get upset when people say Bitcoin has deflation. I'm like, that's absolute rubbish. This total supply of 21 million coins um, has not been exhausted yet. It is only when the full supply has been exhausted, as in all the block rewards have been given up, that we will start to see deflation. But by then, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe the miners are going to have to increase transaction costs, and we could see the chain as a the whole thing. The whole project could could fail. I don't know, it could, could continue somehow. Um, but we will only see deflation occurring after the 21 million coins have been printed. At the moment, where Bitcoin is now, it is still in an inflation. Um, it's, it's, it's going through inflation. Coins are getting uh, mined or minted, created out of thin air, um, every what is it, 20 minutes or so, um, and getting released to, to the miners. So at the moment, Bitcoin is just ejecting money into the system. And it's giving the, the money to, to the miner. The miner then goes to the exchange. Um, and then we've got us who come and we say, yay, we'll buy the Bitcoin off the exchange. And the miners get nice and rich. Well, they have to pay the government for the electricity. And they are, are screwing up the environment. Um, but that's kind of what's what's happening. And if there are more people here who want to buy Bitcoin from the miners, then we're going to see the price go go up. How crop coin would work is that you have the farmers. Okay, you still have the miners doing these checks. So you still have your little miners here, but you have your miners and you have your farmers. Okay, they're coming to sell the coin on the exchange okay and again we have the people you know, the people like you and me you come here and we are going to buy from the exchange now why would we want to buy crop coin okay first of all this inflation myth that oh by the smart contracts keep releasing money to the crop miners uh, the crop farmers is going to inflate the coin and make it worthless that isn't going to happen. Um, I actually should have spoken more about it, um, but I am wary of time. But if you are interested, please check out something known as quantitative easing um, and monetary supply, how injecting more money into an environment, um, into an economy, can increase circulation, and it can actually in, it can kickstart the whole, the whole coin, um, getting people trading it. And what's happening is, when you're coming to buy crop coin okay when you bought bitcoin you were basically funding miners or drug dealers or assassins or who, who were the early users of bitcoin you know you those those kind of dodgy people i think isis as well you can see i'm, I'm using i'm using emotive emotional language i'm sorry i'm being me but when you buy crop coin who are you buying the coin from you're buying it from the guy in india who's got that little farm in a rural part, black wasps attacked his crops, it's failed. He needs this money to feed his family, to feed his community, to, to regrow his livelihood. To the people here in Africa, maybe a drought has plagued the area and, and, and an area is susceptible to large amounts of drought and insurance companies just aren't prepared to take on that amount of concentration risk or they feel that um, you know, Africa is too remote to send in their brokers to, to try price the risk properly and to make sure that there's no fraud. So, so they just leave Africa out altogether. But the farmers in Africa are able to use this coin to create a sort of risk management technique to protect their livelihood, to protect their food source. And by buying into this coin, what you're doing, and that, that's where, that's where it, it does become quite interesting. This is more of... I don't want really to use the word, but it's, it's more of a charity than a business. In a sense, a business is for profit. The charity here is for social good. And therefore, by you buying this coin, okay, buying this coin, 
it is a bit of a social good. You're, you're enabling people not only to just rebuild their farm, but you're enabling farmers all around the world to protect their livelihood, to activate risk management. And then, yeah, you can use this coin um, exactly how you would use Bitcoin, um, which today is, you know, you, you can hold it, uh, you can brag about it on Facebook when the price goes up, um, and you can, okay, that's basically all you can do with Bitcoin at the moment. But more and more merchants are slowly starting to adopt cryptocurrency, and we are going to be seeing, um, you know, I, I do think cryptocurrency is going to power the internet economy, and I do think we might see um, some areas becoming crypto friendly, especially uh, tourist destinations where people from other countries can come. They don't have to worry about changing into uh, the fiat currency in order to to buy, stay at uh, hotels, and all that sort of stuff. So the 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 use case for the coin is yes, at the moment it's it's as pathetic as as Bitcoin, but in the future we could see something as amazing, and that's why people will be encouraged to to hold onto the coin, um, because despite the fact that Coins are getting pumped into the system every time a claim uh, is made and it is validated by the satellite. Um, even though more coins are getting pumped into the system, there will be a lot of people buying the coin because not only can it be used as a cryptocurrency, but in a sense, it is a form of charity. It's a social good. And it's not one of those charities where you give the person money and you know 50% of it disappears via administration costs. What's happening here is this entire ecosystem is designed to be self-sustainable. Um, and that is, of course, the big cherry is to try and get the, the satellite company to accept the crop coin as, as payment. Because then, like I said, this thing does become very much self-substantial. Uh, but that basically is the idea. I mean, I could talk about this for, for a long time. Um, but let me know what your thoughts are. Please let me know if I am having a blonde moment and have totally forgotten like something huge and critical when it comes to, to actuarial science. Please, please let me know in the comment section below. Um, or let me know if you think this idea is dumb or if you've got ways to improve this idea or you think, you know what, this idea actually has legs. Let's um, not set up an ICO. ICOs are bad. Uh, let's let's do some sort of project to try and and get this thing get this thing started. But yeah, let me let me start talking. I've been talking for a very long time, so let me end it off there. Thanks, guys, so much for listening, and keep well. Cheers.